Happy Sabbath, one and all. It's uh, a great delight to worship the living God today. And we are glad that you have joined us in our online worship. I pray that God would continue to bless us and speak to each one of us as Dr. Ronald Robin shares God's message. Let's pray. Our holy and gracious God, loving Father, thank you for the holy Sabbath day. We want to commit ourselves we want to commit our families. We want to commit our loved ones into your hands. And we want to commit your servant, Dr. Arnold Robin, into your hands. I pray that you will use him once again. Pour your spirit, Lord. Let there be clarity. Let there be no issues with technology. And I pray, Father, that you will speak to him and through him to all of us. Bless his ministry abundantly. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Trouble sometimes I hear Filling men's hearts with fear Freedom we all oh dear Now is our stay Humbling your hearts to God Saves from the chesting rod Seek the way pilgrim strod Christians away My Jesus is Coming soon, morning or night, morning or night or noon. Many will meet, Many will meet their, their doom. doom. Trumpets will sound, Trumpets will be sound. and all of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet, righteous meet in the sky, knowing when no one dies, heaven would bow. Troubles will. So be all happy forevermore when we meet on the shore, free from all cares, rising up in the sky, telling us when goodbye, homeward then we shall fly, glory to share. My Jesus is coming. Righteous meet, righteous meet in the sky. Knowing when no one dies, heaven what but My Jesus is coming soon. Morning on morning on night on noon. Many will meet, many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. Greetings and welcome, dear brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for ushering us again and giving us the blessed hope of being a part of God's end time work and assured of God's strength in the last days to go forth and fulfill the great commission God has given his people. Let us bow our heads for prayer as we thank the Lord for this gift and walk onwards in his presence. Let us pray. Mighty God, it is a humbling honor to know that God invites us to love, to celebrate, to recognize that we are part of a sacred work that God has given to his people. Thank you for the opportunity to come together in your presence, to receive light, and to receive the strength to walk in the light of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for your loving faithfulness, for your ever-present love. 
for your constant strivings with us and your hard work that bids us to come live in righteousness. Thank you, God, for choosing to not give up on us. Thank you for loving us, looking at our brokenness, our wretchedness, and still choosing to love us. Thank you, God. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for what you've been teaching us this past week. Lord, as we try to look at all that we've had in the past and its implications for us in our homes today, may you stand magnified. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, friends. Welcome. It, it has been a blessing. God has been faithful beyond measure. And we just want to give God the glory for that which he has committed himself to doing. He is more than able to fulfill. He is a faithful, faithful Savior. Now, let's recap what we've been studying. When you recognize the light in the light of what we've been studying through these past days, you recognize, friends, that God's people at the end of time, you and I, are not living in ordinary time. These are deeply significant times given to us by the Lord to do a deeply significant work. We're recognizing, if you're paying attention, to our, our studies in the past days, it's not just informational things. It's not just good truth that we can now store along with the other truths we've received. This directly just points out, delineates the work we're supposed to be doing as God's people. We recognize when we were looking at the three angels' message throughout our Christian existence, we recognized this is a message. Yes, we're supposed to be preaching at the end of time. But I guess we did not recognize this is not a new message. This is the word of the Lord down the ages. And God has called specific people in different periods of time to take this powerful, life-saving truth to a world that's groping in darkness. And so it is such an honor, my friends. I hope you take time to recognize that. It is such an honor to be called by the Lord to walk in this pathway that he has chosen for us, to do this very sacred work for God's glory in these last days. We're recognizing the three messages of the past Elijahs, our messages. We're recognizing their enemies, similar tripartite entities that are coming against God's people also as we quickly near the end. Now, in the light of all of this, and perhaps I've shared these thoughts with you in the past, I want to go over them now perhaps considering them in the light of what we've studied this week. So if you have your Bible, friends, come with me and we revisit what we've been looking at thus far as we set the stage for something deeper. If you have your Bibles, come me to Malachi 4 again. Let's, let's, let's revisit that very, very wonderful text. Speaking to us of the Elijah, the, the last day Elijah doing that special work. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Malachi. And we're looking at chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6. Malachi 4, 5, and 6, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Speaking of the last Elijah, Elijah of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, the Elijah of the New Testament, and the Lord speaking about the Elijah that's going to come in the, just before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, we're recognizing the Lord speaking to us and telling us Elijah and his work at the end of time. Now, knowing that we have a work to do, 
notice the words of Jesus referring to the work of Elijah. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to chapter 17 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 11. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 17, 11, Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, referring to Elijah, Elias truly shall first come and do what? Restore all things. Praise the Lord. The words of Jesus, Elias truly shall first come and do what? He is going to restore all things. Those are the words of the Lord. Now, why would Jesus say that? What is he saying is the work of the Elijah, the Elijah of old and the Elijah to come. Why is the work of Elijah known as the work of restoration? That's the, that's the thought we are appreciating. And it's something that we want to pay close attention to. For God wants us to recognize the work of Elijah is to put back into place whatever has been out of place. You would remember, that's what the Elijahs of old were doing. Take Elijah on Mount Carmel. What was he doing? Restoring the gospel by repairing the altar. Remember that? Restoring true worship, upholding the commands. That which was long lost, forsaken, ignored, Elijah was pointing people's attention to look back. John the Baptist standing in the river Jordan, restoring the gospel when he points everyone's attention to Jesus, saying, behold, the Lamb of God. He is the one who's going to take away the sins of the world. Restoring true worship, rebuking false worship. Herod, why are you worshiping this one? You have done an unlawful thing by taking your brother's wife. Rebuke. What are we recognizing, friends? We're recognizing that the work of Elijah is indeed a restorative work, that which has been lost sight of, that which has been ignored, that which has not been heeded to. In the light of this, read Revelation, the three angels' message. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, what is it saying? Has this angel flying in the midst of heaven, has what? The everlasting gospel. The gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, nation, kindred, tongue, people. Why? Because the gospel has been lost sight of. There have been so many aberrations to the gospel. So many alternatives presented by the devil for the gospel. So many darkness. So much destruction and dismay. That this becomes a needed work to restore back. To restore back in, the, in, this, in verse 7, to restore back fear for God, glory for God. To restore back the understanding that we're living in the hour of judgment. The, the world and its deceptions and its bright lights can, can benumb us to the reality. We are a people living in judgment. Restoring that appreciation, that reverence. To worship him, verse 7, telling us the first angel's message. To worship, to restore back what true worship is. This is the work of the last day, Elijah. To live in a way that lets the world see that Babylon has fallen and God has stood risen through the ages. And while the wine, as we studied yesterday, while Babylon was busy giving out wine, its false teachings, the people of God are going forth giving the truth of the Lord. While the ba Babylon is busy committing fornication, God's people are busy married to Jesus, faithful to Jesus. Oh, powerful. The third angel's message. A rebuke, a denunciation, a warning if anyone worshiped the beast. And the way, the way God's last day Elijahs are going to pull people out of worshiping the beast is by setting before them true worship. True worship set before the world. Letting people see what true worship is like so that they never feel the need to worship the beast or his image. Verse 12, the patience of the saints. This is something that's been lacking. The word in the Greek referring to perseverance, endurance. To present a persevering character before an unbelieving world. To restore back that perseverance, that hunger, thirst. 
to keep the commands of God, the faith. These are the truths, my brothers and sisters, that God's last Elijahs are called to restore. It's the work of restoration. But then, then we read a fascinating thought, a fascinating thought that comes to us from the book Messages to Young People, page 324. And this is what the prophet says, Messages to Young People, page 324. And listen, listen to these power, power packed words. The prophet says, the restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the home. That's interesting. Elijah is to restore all things. You've just looked at three angels' message in the light of that restorative work. But the prophet is saying this work of restoration has to begin in the home. Now, this is important, friend. This is very important. Because it's not just something we're reading from Spirit of Prophecy. This is exactly what the Elijahs of old were doing. For instance, let's take a look at John the Baptist, Luke 1. And verse 17, Luke 1, and verse 17, speaking of John the Baptist, the Bible says, he shall go before him, go before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elias, that's Elijah. What is he going to do? What is the first work John the Baptist was going to do? To turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Now, John's ministry is defined and his restorative work begins by getting the heart of the fathers restored back with the children. So John the Baptist himself, the Bible says, his, the second Elijah of the Bible, the restorative work that he had come to do began by getting the family together, fathers' hearts right with the children. This is where the work of restoration began for John himself. Now, let's consider the last Elijahs, Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. Malachi 4, 5 and 6, God saying, Elijah the prophet, will, I'll send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what is the first work of this last day, Elijah? To turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Again, the very first work. The very first work of restoration of all the Elijahs, and this is, friends, understand, this is an identifying marker that God's true Elijahs of the last days are individuals who are bringing restoration in the home. Hence, we're speaking of Elijah's home, we're speaking of your home. If you are God's last Elijah, how is your home? Has the, have the walls of have the walls been restored with godly truth? How is your home? You see, friend, you have to restore that which has been broken down. Elijah had to restore, repair the altar because it had been broken down, it neglected, ignored. Have you taken a good look at your home to see what is out of place and how it needs to be set in place? There's a marvelous text found in the New Testament. Paul points out these very interesting words. And I want you to come with me to Philippians chapter 4. It's a very well-known text, but I'd like you to consider this with me again. Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to see this text in the light of the family. Philippians chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 8. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, or whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, when you read that text, you recognize, all oh, right, so whatever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, if there's any praise, I should keep my mind thinking about these things. All right, that's good. But then 
you unpack the choice of words. This this brilliant scholar, by the way, Paul was a very learned man. He uses specific words. And he's not just saying sort of think as in intellectually, mentally sort of just dwell on these things, but rather that word think in the Greek is the Greek word logizomai, which really means, friends, to take an inventory. To take an inventory. Uh, a store owner is more familiar with, with, with inventory. Uh, when, when, when a store opens in the morning, the, the, the store owner makes a list. And as it, it looks at this list from the previous day, because he did do that when he closed the store. As he opens in the morning, he reviews the list and he says, okay, I've got four bars of soap, three bottles of shampoo. I've got two bottles of oil. And he checks, this is what is there whether I have these things in place or not. At the end of the day, and through every transaction, he makes, a, he makes a mark, he takes a note, and at the end of the day, he prepares a new list. It's a new inventory list. It's a, it's a continuous work. It's not an event. It's a regular experience. Continues to check whether I have these things or not, whether these things are in place or not, whether it's all accounted for or not. See, what Paul is saying is not just to sit back and sort of mentally just dwell on these things. Paul is saying, take an inventory of these things. Take an inventory of, of, of whether you are dwelling, whether your mind uh, is dwelling upon that which is true, pure, honest, lovely, good report, virtue, praise. Are you dwelling? Take an inventory. Are these things a part of your life? But now, in the light of the Elijah ministry and Elijah's home, what I need you to consider, friends, is you as a family need to take an inventory of whether your home is dwelling upon things that are true, noble, honest, pure, lovely, good virtue, praise. Am I, more individually speaking, more personally speaking, am I as a member of the family dwelling upon these things or not. I need to take an inventory individually. And while it's a collective work, while God is speaking to the entire family, God is speaking to your home, Elijah's home in the last days. God is also speaking to every individual family member. Am, am I dwelling on something? Am I bringing something into the home that is not pure, that is not true? Am I bringing something into the home that is not lovely, that is not worthy of praise, that is not just? Am I tainting the last day Elijah's home by what I am dwelling upon, by, by what my heart is cherishing? Consider that prayerfully, friends. What am I doing at a very personal level that may be hindering the work of Elijah? hindering the work I'm supposed to be doing for the Lord at the end of time. This, this, is, this is very personal, friends. This gives it a, a, a very personal push. All this while, all right, God's remnant church should be doing this work. It, it, it almost seems a little far-fetched, although we are the church. But now God's pressing the work even closer. What he's saying is, if the work of restoration, as the prophet just pointed out, if the work of restoration begins in the home, the place where the three angels' messages need to be lived, not just spoken, the place where the three angels' messages need to be lived is first in your own home. That's where the work begins. And listen, friends, if we are God's true Elijah's, we will not break this divine design God has ordained. This is how we will take the work forward. If we indeed want to be successful witnesses of the truth, if we want to be successful proclaimers, if we want to be faithful final heralds of the Lord, the work has to begin at home. It's the call to inspect our home. It's a call to really take a closer look, put a magnifying glass over our home and really examine, are we truly living in the light of the Lord? 
And it, it, it and it's a very personal work as well because it applies to every single family member. Not just you as a collective body, but also you as an individual member of the family. Perhaps I may be doing something, perhaps I'm dwelling or cherishing something that is tainting the final work we're supposed to do as a family. That's what the Elijahs are doing. Notice, the Elijahs of old did exactly this same thing. They began at home. They began at home. In Gideon's story, perhaps we, we see a similar picture. Before he goes out, the famous battle of Gideon in the 300, he first goes and breaks his own father's idols. Gets the home right first. Listen, friends. If we want to be successful in the battles outside, we've got to be victorious in the battles within. If we want to go out, God's people understood this. Gideon understood this. Take a look at the Achan and, and Israel. There was sin in the camp. How are they going to defeat another nation? They were sorry. They were destroyed. While sin is in the camp, how can you seek to be victorious over another nation? This is, this is powerful. And God's invitation us, to us, friends, is to reconsider ourselves, our lives, as we live together as a family. Now, all of this gains a completely different impetus in the light of what the prophet says elsewhere. Let's take a look at another truth. Let's take a look at another truth the prophet highlights. This is found in Adventist Home, page 15. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing, friends. This is not a new message. I think I've shared these thoughts with you in the past. The prophet says, Adventist Home, page 15. Home should be made all that the word implies. It should be a little heaven upon earth. Home should be made all that the word implies. It should be a little heaven upon earth. Now recognize, friends, the prophet is saying our homes are to be a little heaven upon earth. In other words, if we neglect, if we neglect the heavenly work, reflections of heaven from our homes to the world, we are neglecting what it means to be a home for the Lord in the last days. If restoration begins at home, then we've got to give people a taste of heaven in and through our homes. Following us closely? Why is this important? Why is this work of restoration important in the home? Because notice, again, friends, it's not just a thought on good family living. This is not just a family seminar. This has got deeply, deeply important end time implications. Luke 1 and verse 17. The work of Elijah, the second Elijah in the New Testament, John the Baptist, and the work he's doing in the spirit and power of Elijah, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Why? To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In other words, the way you prepare the world for the coming of the Lord is to start the work of restoration at home. It gets very personal. Good. You want to go preach, mount pulpits, travel nations, give out the good gospel message, praise God. But if you want to truly be impactful, start at home. That's what the Elijahs do. And friends, if we are the true Elijahs of the Lord, we will have our homes in order. The ones who we are appealing to get ready for heaven we will give them a glimpse of heaven through our homes. That's how we prepare the world for Jesus. That's how we are preparing the world for Jesus. friends. By making our homes a little heaven upon earth. Notice, friends, this is the last. Now, now, now you would recognize this is why the enemy is fighting you so hard. This is why he's attacking your homes so hard, because he knows one home set right in the Lord. Even if one home begins to reflect the light of heaven upon earth, 
even if one home becomes a symbol of what heaven is like, it's going to, it's going to be devastating for the devil. And that's why perhaps, listen now, and I want you to understand this prayerfully, perhaps this is why he even pushes you to go minister outside. Is someone listening? Perhaps this is why he pushes you to go, oh, go share here, go share there, but neglect your home. You don't have time for this. There are souls waiting out there to be baptized. Oh, what a deception. I'm not ignoring the fact that there are souls waiting out there, but not at the cost of your own family. The prophet speaks to us clearly. You can never ignore the inner circle for the sake of the outer circle. You cannot. Jesus' own words to the disciples. Acts chapter 1, let's go there. Jesus' own words, Acts chapter 1. As he's about to ascend into the heavens, what does he say to the disciples? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me. Both where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Wait a minute. He started with Jerusalem because Jerusalem was home. To all of them. Start with home. Then go to Judea, Samaria, Uttermost. But start with Jerusalem. This is, this friends, of course, is important. We recognize we've got to get our homes right. But perhaps we've not recognized our homes being right is directly connected to the end time work of the Lord. So this is not just an added work. This is not just part of the list. It's the first work we need to start. It's the thing that should be given priority in the restorative ministry we're called to do. Elijah's home should be a bright and shining example. How is Elijah's home? How is your home? Has it become a little heaven on earth where people can come, get a foretaste of heaven, and long for that heaven with Jesus? Homes where you can go and find peace, find shelter, find refuge, find glimpses of the character of Christ in the lives of the family members. God is looking to establish such homes in these last days. And he wants your home to be that home. For if he's called you to be an Elijah, he's not just called you to go take the three angels' message to the world. He wants you to start with the three angels' message at home. And so I plead with you, friends, today that we need to consider prayerfully. We need to really consider prayerfully what God is calling us to. And what this really means. A few points before we close. I mean, we've looked at the Elijah work. We're just not recognizing how important it is in the light of our own homes. So this is just bringing all we've learned in the light of our own individual family. These truths need to be right and settled in the family. Your children, your spouses. If you know these Bible texts, if you give God this message right, make sure your spouse also knows it. It shouldn't be that when it's time to share, your spouse says, oh, please, you go ahead and share. Or you go. should be like, let's share together. Everybody should be on board with a profound understanding. Your children should be on board with a profound understanding of these truths. If you've had victory in one area of your Christian life, help your family gain that victory too. Share each other's victorious experiences. This is where restoration begins. And friends, we're already living in the end. When do we start this work at home and when do we get out? Are you catching this? Are you catching the urgency of this message? And then the prophet elevates this even further. The prophet elevates this even further. She's saying our home should be a little heaven on earth. Now, the only time God uses that language elsewhere is when he's speaking about heaven. Rather, when he's speaking about the sanctuary. As he says to Moses, come with me to Hebrews chapter 8 and, and, and listen to the words of God to Moses. 
Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. The Bible says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that is God, for see, saith God, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So Moses is told that you are to build the tabernacle just as it is in heaven. I've shown you the pattern. Make sure you make it exactly according to the pattern here on earth. This is precisely what the prophet is also saying. That our home should be a little heaven upon earth. So as it is, this is how heaven is. This is how it should be in the home. And the only other message that comes with a similar language is the sanctuary message. This is how it is in heaven, the sanctuary. Just like that, it should be on earth. The prophet is saying that's exactly what the home is like. This is how heaven is. And that's exactly what our home should be, a little heaven on earth. God is saying is then, friends, the sanctuary has been broken. And it's the home sanctuary, friends, that's broken. And God's calling for a restoration, not just to preach the message of the end of time in our churches, but in our home sanctuaries. What about our home sanctuaries? Where is the restorative work happening in our home? Are the bricks laid right? Is the foundation correct? What about the principles of the home sanctuary? Is my family prepared for the coming of the Lord? In other words, friends, if you're part of a family, you're actually part of the sanctuary. Appreciated that? If you're part of a family, you're part of the sanctuary of the Lord. You're called to get going, get working, to restore these truths in your home sanctuary first. And this is a divine command. This is a divine command from the Lord, friends. Something he wants us to set right. Something he wants us to present before the world so that the world can see what it means to really be living in the Lord. So, notice, in the light of what we're looking at, Adventist home, the prophet says, notice this, God would have our families symbols of the family in heaven. Wow. Do you now recognize why the devil strikes your home so bad? Why he creates the agitations in your marital bonds, in your, in your parental responsibilities, in your parent-child relationship? Why does he brings so much struggle because he is terrified. He's terrified that the society would see a symbol of heavenly families in these earthly families. And hence he, he deviates, he distracts us from our home so that we get busy trying to fix other people's homes. Are you there? Many people in ministry ministering to so many other people's homes while their own home lays barren. So, so this message is filled with rebuke, my friend. Trying to repair so many homes. Friends of mine who would, who would, who would, who would ask me to, to please share with our family, and I'm sharing, and they're so blessed, so happy. The Lord speaking to me, son, your home. You don't think no, you don't think any restoration is needed there? What about your home? Restoration in Elijah's home first before he goes out to bring that restorative work to the world. Why? Because the sanctuary has to be shown to the world so that other homes long to prepare these home sanctuaries where the Lord dwells, because that's what makes a sanctuary a sanctuary. Otherwise, it's just a tent. It's only four walls. What made the sanctuary a sanctuary was God's presence. Moses only built a tent. What made it a sanctuary was God's presence. Solomon only built a building. What made it a temple was God's presence. In a similar fashion, you only have 
individuals. What makes it a home sanctuary is when the Lord is in the midst of your home. When the Lord is in the midst of your family. I'm going to look at a few more principles, rather one very pristine principle in the light of the, the home sanctuary. Notice, notice what the Lord tells us about the sanctuary experience. Now, if you look at it with me, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Let's, let's visit that. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. 1 John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Follow closely. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And friends, if God is light, here's what's interesting. If you look back at the sanctuary, did you know that the sanctuary was filled with light? There was light everywhere. What do I mean? If you came to the outer court, there was light at the altar burn offering with the fire that was burning. It was lighted 24-7. If you went into the holy place, the candlesticks had fire. It had light that was 24-7 burning. In the most holy place where God's glory came and dwelt, it was a bright place because God's glory was just literally physically bright light there too. So no matter what compartment you were in, no matter where you were in the sanctuary, you always had access to light. That's because the sanctuary is God's dwelling. And where God is, the Bible says, in him, he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In other words, God was everywhere. Light was everywhere in the home. Hmm. If you pay close attention then, if God's asking us to engage in the sacred work of being engaged in the sanctuary work, of restoring our home sanctuary, then friends, shouldn't light be everywhere? Shouldn't light be everywhere? Shouldn't light be in every area, in every experience, in every act, in every conversation, in our going in and going out, shouldn't God, his light, be everywhere? And the thing was, friends, because, because the sanctuary was a sanctuary, the sanctuary didn't have holidays. Do you catch that? It wasn't like the sanctuary took day off. It says, oh, for a few days, the sanctuary is going to be closed. Not accepting offerings, not accepting uh, forgiveness, not accepting repentance. We're going to be closed for a few days. <laughs> the sanctuary never took a break from being a place of holiness, a place of light. You see, friends, if the Lord is saying your homes are to be a sanctuary on earth, are to be that little heaven on earth, then the truth is, friends, you as a family can take break from being holy. Are you there? You can't take a break from living in holiness. You can't say, oh, too much Bible study, too much prayer. We've spent well, weeks of prayers and looking at different series on, on the final Herald channel. We've been, this is too much. We should take a few days off, a few weeks off of this. What? Actuaries don't take breaks from holiness. Hey, don't misunderstand me. I'm not against you going out with your family into nature, enjoying the wonderful creation of God. I'm speaking about you can take a break from the holiness that God has called you to. Light everywhere. Light everywhere. And guess what? Wherever Israelites went, the sanctuary went with them. Are you catching that? Wherever they went, they carried the sanctuary with them. In other words, holiness was with them always. Light was with them wherever they went. It wasn't like, oh, we left the sanctuary back there. They had to carry and walk in God's presence wherever they went. Now, it's interesting 
what God says about that light. You want to focus on that. Uh, come with me to Matthew chapter 5. And you, you know this. This is a very well-known text. But we're going to look at it in the light of our families, our homes. Because Jesus <laughs> presents a, a pointer on the home life when he speaks of this. So Matthew 5. And I'd like you to read with me verse 15 and 16, Matthew 5, 15, 16. The Bible says, Jesus' words, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on where? On a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Hmm. It says, men don't light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick. And what does the candlestick do? It gives light unto all that are in the house. Powerful. Is it that in your family, it's just you, your spouse, or some family member who is that super holy person? They're the ones always praying and studying the Bible, spending time with God, but what about you? Because the Bible says the purpose of the light, and if God is the light in your home, the purpose of light is to bring light to all, not to few selected individuals. The purpose of God in your home is to bring light to every individual. Perhaps it's you, the individual, who is rejecting that light. Perhaps it's you who's received the light, but not all of it. You've been shown the light, but you're refusing to walk in it. Perhaps there's an area of your life where God is pressing upon you, child, walk in it. And the truth is, if you do, you'll set an example, a righteous example for your family members. Restoration. Don't forget that. As God's last day, Elijah's, restoration is the work. Bring light to all in the house. Don't be someone who's bringing darkness into the house by your thoughts, by your demeanor, by your words, by your diet. Bring light. Something the Lord wants us to pay attention to. Something the Lord wants us to keep in mind. Now, if you keep reading, someone's saying, how does this light look like? All right, someone's asking, all right, God is light. Now, now, in practical terms, how does this light look like? Can people see this light? Yes. You're saying, brother, what? This light can be seen? Yes. Let's keep reading. Matthew 5 and verse 15, Jesus said, uh, do men, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. All right. And now in verse 16, Jesus says, now if all have received this light, verse 16 says, let your light so shine, ooh, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, wait a minute. Your light can be seen how? In your good works. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You can reflect the God who is light by your lifestyle, by living the life of Jesus, by reflecting the character of Jesus. And as you do so, they will see Jesus' character in you and glorify your Father in heaven. People should be able to tell this is not humanly possible. This is not humanly possible. This brother, I know this brother, he could never be like this. This is really Jesus at work. This definitely has to be Jesus at work. That's the appeal. Now, Luke, a parallel text to what's taking place in Matthew 5, notice what Luke says about the same story words it differently and it's so powerful here jesus says men don't light a candle put it on a bushel put it on a candlestick and it gives light to all that are in the house luke dr luke puts this added emphasis in verse 16 luke 8 verse 16 luke chapter 8 and verse 16 notice what the doctor says oh well jesus words jesus's words he's quoting jesus and he says no man, when he had lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel. Luke 8, 16. No man, when he had lighted a candle, 
covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. Powerful. If God, the light of the universe, is dwelling in your heart, is dwelling in your home, then all who enter, every visitor, the delivery person, the mailman, neighbor, all who enter should be able to see the light. Elijah's work. That is Elijah's home. And we're called to be a part of this, friends. We're called to be a part of this special sacred work. Light. Something else in the sanctuary. And again, if you understand and recognize this principle, you can study, refer, study back to sanctuary and recognize that the principles that are applied in the sanctuary should be applied in the home as well. For instance, when you take a look at light, there was also incense. Remember, there was also incense, a very important aspect of the sanctuary experience. It's what made, it's what made the, the sanctuary fragrant. Now, now, now the thing is, the incense was there and it was connected with the prayers of, of the, the priest's prayers. But the incense, and we've studied this together when we had a series in the sanctuary, the incense really represented the righteousness of Christ mingled with the prayers and that's what made our makes our prayers acceptable you see friends that was needed because the altar of incense you know the picture the altar of incense was kept right next to the veil that separated the holy from the most holy and it is on this veil where blood was sprinkled throughout the year as a representation of the sins of the of israel as they came and confessed, brought an animal, blood was taken, it was sprinkled on this veil. Why it was important was, friends, because in the sanctuary, in the holy place, there was no ventilation. There was no cross ventilation. There was only one entrance. And imagine blood and the stench of blood over the year collected must smell terrible in there. But the old repentance was kept right next to it. And that fragrance spread everywhere, drowning the stench of that sin. It's so powerful. So powerful. And I want you to listen carefully, friends. It wasn't like every place in the sanctuary was spotless. No, this veil was stained with sin. The sanctuary work was to drown that stench of sin in that incense, which represented the righteousness of Christ. Now, when we look at our home sanctuaries also, surely we're not spotless, are we? Perhaps there are family members who've erred, who've done great evils, committed grave evils. And they stand in need of love and forgiveness. Are you praying like the priest is praying for the sin of the sinner? Are you praying sincerely for that family member? It's easy to point out fingers and point out the flaws of your family members. Are you sincerely, wholeheartedly interceding for your brethren? Because when you pray, the righteousness of Christ mingled with that prayer can drown the stench of their sin. God's not asking you to overlook sin. No, 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 no. God's asking you to intercede for their sin. Sin cannot be overlooked. Sin has to be dealt with. God's asking you to be a part of that work. There are many errors 
God's not asking us to stand and point fingers and keep rebuking all day. God's asking, will you be co-intercessors with me as I live to intercede for them? Will you join hands with me to intercede for your family members who are struggling, who are weak, who are broken, who are living in sin? Let us work together so that the righteousness of Christ can make their lives fragrant with the righteousness of Jesus. A life that is now reeking of the stench of sin. It can be drowned as the righteousness of Christ takes over. What a special work. What a sacred work. And friends, it's easy when we talk of prophecy. We're quick to talk about end time events happening, the papacy, the United States, conspiracies at play. All of these things we can see, and these are easy to talk about and deal with. But sure, while all of this evil is happening, what are we doing? What is our work? What is my work as God's last Elijah? Isn't my work supposed to be preparing myself and my family? Isn't my work supposed to be to, to prepare our home for the coming of the Lord? And that by my home being prepared, I can set an example for others to be prepared for the Lord. This is the difficult part. It's easy to mount a pulpit. Point out Babylon. What's the alternative? Give them the alternative. Show them a home. That is a little heaven on earth. Brethren, how is Elijah's home today? How is Elijah's home today? Is it the home God has desired it to be? If you see a lack, a failure, a shortcoming, look to him, for he is able. Hebrews 7.25, he's able to save to the uttermost. But the verse tells us, Hebrews 7.25 tells us, he's able to save to the uttermost, but only those who come unto God by him. He is able. But he can only save those who come. Let us bring our homes to the Lord. That he may truly make them home sanctuaries for the Lord. This is the first work. This is where restoration should begin. The work of Elijah. There is coming a day when the shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day will be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear.
shall see him, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Join me in prayer. Let us kneel as we pray before the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you again. Your word is special. It is true. It is from everlasting to everlasting. It is faithful. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to study it with my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the blessed assurance that we can succeed in the Lord. Thank you, God. You truly are able. Sure, there are failures, there are shortcomings, but there's nothing you cannot fix if we but come to you. Thank you, God. What you have promised, you are able to perform. So humble us, please. Show us how we can join hands with you and be a part of the sacred restorative work in these last days. May your name be praised, my Lord, now and into eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.